The Pokemon Company are making sure that we're never going to be able to catch them all. Johnny and I have our review of the Batman, and I've got some further thoughts. And I've got my review of the PlayStation 5's big racing game for 2022, Gran Turismo 7. All that and the latest in everything cool today in The Rundown. Hey, welcome to The Rundown. My name is Victor Lucas, and I'm so happy that you've joined me here in the Electric Playground. We've got all kinds of fun stuff to talk about today, and today's show is dedicated to Giga Vega, who said, awesome, the review I was waiting for. Elden Ring, what an amazing game. Great review and spot on, Vic. Thank you, Giga Vega. I've been getting a ton of comments about uh, Elden Ring, but also the Batman and all kinds of other stuff that we've been talking about. There is so much happening right now it is crazy I think we've just had the best February in history for video games and entertainment and uh, March isn't slowing down we've got lots of stuff to get into today let's get started with your rundown over the weekend the Pokemon company had a Pokemon presents event where they showed off some of the stuff that's headed our way they talked about established you know existing Pokemon experiences that are out there like Pokemon go and Pokemon unite and stuff but the big deal about this little pre preview of video event that they put together is that there is a new Pokemon game, yet another big Pokemon game coming to the Nintendo Switch at, at the end of 2022. It is Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And what's interesting about this game is that it's, uh, it's a new generation of Pokemon, so it exists al along the timeline, but it's another open world type of experience. I think similar in some, some ways, in some kind of design ways to uh, what Legends Arceus just did for us. And that's gonna be coming out at the end of 2022. We don't know too much about the game. Uh, we're gonna see established and existing Pokemon characters throughout this, uh, but we're also gonna be introduced to new Pokemon, which is gonna be pretty, uh, fun and uh, you know I think it's going to be quite interesting to see some of these new creations and of course they also wanted to uh, talk to us about the new starters that we have for the game Sprigatito, Fuik Fui, Coco, and Quaxly. So we have this kind of duck type character and uh, and uh, a little grass cat type character. And I, I don't know, like a platypus type thing or something like that. So um, I, I don't quite know how to describe these characters. I think I'm leaning towards the duck. I think so. But it's definitely, you know, a little bit weird for me, for sure, to be jumping onto another hype train for another Pokemon experience when I'm still playing Arceus. It's massive. It's so much fun. And there's still so much for me to do with that game. And, and now, actually, there is new content, actually, because part of the Pokemon Presents is that there is um, uh, some n new uh, trainers to go out and fight and some uh, new legendary uh, Pokemon characters that you can pick up along the way um, and so this is I think it's all available right now you can download this right now to Arceus so if you've completely thrashed everything in the game and you've unlocked everything and found everything you're you're good to go with some new stuff in there and also Pokemon um, Pearl and uh, Diamond for the Nintendo Switch the one that came out <laughs> two months ago the, the, the pace on these Pokemon games is insane uh, that also has a, uh, a mysterious new Pokemon and the way that you access this is you get a letter from Professor Oak and you can go and find this uh, this character. So there's some new content in um, Shining Pearl and Brilliant Diamond, which is kind of crazy. Um, and then there's also some new stuff in Unite. I've never played the Pokemon Unite game, which is kind of like a MOBA type of experience. They've got legendary Pokemon in here. Um, and and uh, it's supposed to be even crazier in terms of combat and, and the mechanics of the game. Looks cool. I've never played Unite. Are you guys fans of this Pokemon Unite game? There was also new stuff for uh, uh, Pokemon Go as well and Pokemon Cafe. There are There's a lot of Pokemon. And um, the question I pose to all of you has uh, Pokemon fatigue set in? Are you getting a little exhausted by all of these updates? You know, all of these different uh, experiences to get excited for, particularly these big, massive ones that are meant to be enjoyed over months and months and months. I, I mean, I have a feeling that Arceus is still going to be, uh, you know, a new experience for people all the way through 2022. It's It feels very weird to me that Pokemon uh, and Nintendo say, we've got to produce another one this year. You know, I tweet tweeted kind of cheekily that Call of Duty is planning to take a break, but Pokemon is doubling down 
on uh, new releases. But, you know, if you are a Pokemon fan, I want to hear from you. Tell me why you're excited. Um, and, you know, honestly, they're working hard to keep you excited in the Pokemon universe. Another universe that's uh, working hard to keep you excited is the DC movie universe. I saw the Batman this week with Johnny Millennium, and we've got our review for you right now. Yeah, it's a, oh, yeah, it's yeah, a dirge, yeah. and I, I, I feel like, you know, maybe it's the build to the inevitable, like, heroes theme later, right, like right. if they make sequels, but it just feels too... It almost reminded me of uh, Eyes Wide Shut, the terrible oh, music from Eyes Wide Shut. And it's, it permeates the whole That's movie. Funny. And they also lean into uh, because one of the things that they've said about this portrayal of Batman is that they, they look to Kurt Cobain as an influence and they lean into what? Nirvana music. Yeah, that's why he is so moody, and he's got his hair oh, in his eyes. What and, is going on? Uh, he, I didn't know any of this. Yeah, so. he's very well. You know, I'm a fan. So You're I, a bit of a fan, <laughs> this guy. He I've been reading Batman. and watching, and you know, that's I've been, cool though. But yeah. I, I was super impressed with this movie, though. Yeah. It's really up high there. I don't know if it's my favorite of the Batman films. No, but the craftsmanship is unbelievable, and the the the. You know, Jeff, they, Jeffrey Wright is an amazing Gordon. He's fantastic yeah, he as, as Gordon. They care about this property, yeah. and it shows. Yes. It shows in his portrayal, in the detective story. And yes. it, realistically, it is a detective story all the way through. Yes. Figuring out what's, what's going on with the Riddler. We won't say anything Did like you that. also like the echoes of Blade Runner in here, too? The oh, noir-esque, and the rain, and dude, the old technology that, that's, that's so new. Weird. This is so weird. Yeah. Right? I'm getting shivers now. Because yeah. when I was in the theater, there was a moment I was like, this is like Blade Runner. Yeah. Especially sometimes the narration yes. reminded me very much. Very of that. much. And that's my favorite movie of all time. Well, so it has, it, has that kind of it's to it. very yeah. pulpy. It's very film noir. Yeah. It's very Batman. Very Batman. I loved it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. I, I'm going to go a little bit less on it. I really enjoyed the movie. It was a little long. I, I thought it could be condensed a little bit more. An 8 out of 10 for me. Okay. 9.5 and an 8. Go see it. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Batman because there were a couple things that I didn't get to in the review because, you know, when we see these movies, we um, pop out of the theater and set up a camera and just start to go. Unless I do the review the day after here in the basement or something like that, I just don't really have time to put all of my thoughts together. Um, but there was something that was really profound about that film for me. You know, you guys know I'm a massive Batman fanatic, and I, you know, I've, he's been my favorite superhero and one of my favorite characters in fiction forever. But Matt Reeves really put together something remarkable with this movie, and I, I, I've been sort of in awe of the craftsmanship of the film and the beauty of the film. But it's also struck me that I'm not really into it for the you know the licensed material around it like i am not really concerned that there isn't a batman video game that's tied to this or batman i'm not gonna be picking up all the batman action figures you know and it's partially to do with some of the creative choices i'm not crazy about the costume i'm not crazy about the batmobile although i did pick up a little mini uh hot wheels batmobile the other day um you can see it it's right there this one right there boop it's tiny it's out of focus um but that's it you know and what is remarkable for me is like I've, i love the tumbler of course i love the tim burton batmobile back in the day uh and you know the adam west one and i loved so much of the iconography associated with batman on film or on television but this movie it, it, it isn't so much that like i'm not gonna buy a riddler figure but i have a heath ledger joker figure you know and that's weird to me. It's a new phenomenon for me because of so much, you know, attention that I've paid to bat merchandise over the years. But I think it speaks more to the beauty uh, and the, the holistic experience of the film. It's very analogous, like I said in the review, to Blade Runner and to uh, what Denis Villeneuve just recently did with Dune. You know, it's one of these sit down and just be treated to just this visual splendor and this great sort of marriage of um, interesting characters and beautiful imagery and great, you know, a great audio score, although I wasn't super thrilled with uh, Giacchino's music. Um, you can see the creative choices around all of that, you know, and you can feel the, the real effort to build art with this film. And that's what has shocked me the most about this this new Batman film. It's not just like a, 
a, a massive enterprise. It's not like you, you can see all the calculations and all the business stuff around it, um, the, the Happy Meal kind of qualities of it. Uh, it's a Batman movie kind of made for adults or for longtime fans uh, of the character and the property that haven't really been served a Batman film like this. I think Nolan came close with a lot of his creative decisions, but there was also this, uh, you know, this element of showing off the cool tech and the, uh, uh, you know, the cool settings and the cool car and, um, you know, getting people sort of fascinated with all of the the goods of Batman, which there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, there's a James Bondian kind of quality around Batman for sure. Uh, but this one, like I mentioned in in my review with Johnny, it feels more like an art house superhero movie. And I don't know if it's going to play for everybody. I don't know if everybody is going to like it. I, I know right now the reviews are fantastic. I saw IGN gave it a 10 out of 10. I saw Chris Stuckman raving about it. But I've also seen people that were a little less enthused by some of the um, uh, Robert Pattinson choices and decisions there because he doesn't really change too much from his demeanor as Bruce Wayne and Batman but I chalk it up to in terms of storytelling that he's still learning how to become both you know like he's still young and he's still trying to figure out what the lines are and what his role is in all of this and it's wonderful but you know like I say in the review it's really about the the, the sort of detective qualities of the character, which I've always wanted in these movies. He's also quite a bit more acrobatic and, and uh, interesting physically than we've seen in sort of the robotic and stiff motion of, of uh, previous Batman movies, which, you know, let's face it, and as Robert Pattinson has said, and you know, all of us Bat nerds kind of feel, there are some less than great Batman movies, but they're all interesting, and there's some interesting choices and interesting material in all of them, and there are some excellent Batman movies. I still don't know if the Batman is my favorite of the Batman movies. Uh, I love the animated stuff, too. There's some excellent animated work out there. Um, but it's wonderful. It's just a real gift, and I think we have to sort of applaud Matt Reeves for um, being you know, an auteur with this and being really true to his vision and getting everybody to kind of play, including the studio, including DC Comics, to kind of play with him to build his vision. Uh, and I was very, very happy with it. So uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this film, obviously. I can't wait to watch it again. Um, even though it's three hours and I'm not gonna be watching it every month, like I said in the review, uh, I, it's really, you know, a success. It's wonderful. And I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Obviously, it hasn't come out, so I've done my best to try to be non-spoilery, both in what I shot with Johnny and what I've been talking about right here. Um, I am planning to do a spoiler conversation with a Bat fan or two that makes sense for us to have a chat about um, with this film. Let's tear it apart a little bit, talk about it. Uh, but I definitely want to hear from you guys once you've seen it, okay? Let me know in the comments below uh, what your thoughts are on Matt Reeves' The Batman. Okay, we are going to move on to some of the news that's been a little unsettling revolving around NVIDIA out there. NVIDIA got hacked. They had a data breach from some hackers, uh, which are still anonymous. We don't know where they are in the world, but they got hacked and leaks have started to come out from this organization, which is asking NVIDIA to release the source code for their uh, video drivers and make it open source. But one of the things that has happened is that NVIDIA has been working on something codenamed NVN2, which is associated with the original Switch. And this looks like it's going to be source code for the Switch Pro and the processing power of a new chip and a new processor to be able to offer DLSS 2.2, which will give us um, much better rendering power and resolution for what is likely to be a new Switch. It's codenamed along the same lines as the original uh, chip, and NVIDIA is a big part of that as well. It's a system on a chip in the original Switch. So um, the leak is basically suggesting that a Switch 2 uh, or a Switch Pro or some kind of revision on the Switch is in um, uh, deep in development, 
But it's not a surprise. It's not a shock, you know? Like, it's clear that people uh, have made the original Switch and now the Switch OLED an incredibly successful platform and that Nintendo is probably going to pick up the baton on however much progress they've been able to make with this machine and carry this idea forward, this hybrid kind of console idea and concept. And so we've been talking about the Switch Pro and this Switch 2 leaks and rumors for a long time. Um, there's other stuff out there, other kinds of, you know, information that's been leaked by these hackers as well. And I have to be honest, it makes my skin crawl that we are talking about stuff that has been, uh, you know, nefariously absconded with and shared with the world. But it is, you know, it's been trending on Twitter and we've been riding this roller coaster of hype and, and um uh, expectation about when Nintendo was going to upgrade their Switch console. And of course, the OLED machine came out uh, at the end of 2021, and it's terrific. It's an amazing machine, but it's the same guts, the same horsepower as the launch Switch. So even though it's got a much better screen and everything looks crisper and sharper and it's bigger and it's got a better stand and better audio, it's still pretty much the same Switch experience. So uh, there are games that just sort of chug a little bit and slow down, and there's software that we want to play at 60 frames per second. There's software that this machine can't really play, so there's been some weird decisions to uh, you know, go to the cloud and let people play things that way. So I, I feel like the world is itching, especially the fan base around Nintendo, the the adopters of the Switch that love the machine, like I do. It's still my it's my favorite game console. I love the freaking machine because of its you know awesome lineup, but also its uh, interesting threads throughout gaming history. It's just such a cool system. Um, so I can't wait for the official announcement, but it kind of breaks my heart that uh, um, this was done so shadily, you know, that, that we're starting again to ramp up the hype and, and the expectation on all this. Now, what Nintendo has said, I think it was a couple years ago now, so, you, you know, we're past that point, but they had said that they are in the halfway point of the Switch 1's life cycle so we likely have at least a year or possibly into 2024 before um, we even hear about the successor to the nintendo switch but uh, it definitely does look like it's uh, it's well in development and it's going to have enough horsepower, especially with DLSS 2.2 to, you know, kind of keep up with the 4K machines out there. You know, it might not have all of the, the, the brute force horsepower that we'll get out of a PS5 or an Xbox Series X, but it will be a much easier machine for people that are building you know, games to spec on those systems to also do the ports on this, whatever the new Switch is called, you know. Um, so it's uh, a little bit heartbreaking that we're re getting this information from thieves, um, but that's what's out there right now. And Nintendo is a, a very secretive company and they may take this initiative that this stuff has been leaked out because we know that they're working um, with... Uh, uh, AMD's algorithmically based uh, resolution bump up, um, what was it called, FSR or something like that, um, for the uh, the new Switch sports game that's coming out later this summer. So they are looking at uh, software resolution bump up ideas to make their games look better already. And so we may see some interesting, you know, sidesteps and moves around the fact that this information has leaked out there. They may decide, hell no, we're not going to let the, uh, you know, outside world tell us when this machine should come out. Let's change our plans dramatically. Um, but it does feel like in, within the next 12 months, uh, the, the, the rumors are going to turn into uh, um, some really rock solid information about whatever is coming next. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Crappy way to find out about it, though, huh? Don't you think? Okay, uh, let's move on. I've got a review for you guys of Gran Turismo 7. I can't believe I've been reviewing video games since 
before the first Gran Turismo. I still remember the first Gran Turismo hitting the PlayStation 1 and reviewing it with my buddy Tommy Delarico and both of us just, you know, with our jaws on the floor, like, wow, this is so realistic. And obviously, Gran Turismo 7 is taking full advantage of the PlayStation 5. It's been a game long in development. Um, there's been all kinds of, uh, you know, anticipation and speculation about this. There was an enormous uh, state of play from PlayStation about three or four weeks ago just sort of diving into all of the details with this gloriously beautiful game it's a game that really kind of stretches out across a bunch of different directions but at its core this is a game that celebrates the cars you know celebrates the sort of history of cars and all of these brands of cars and this has been true for for the Gran Turismo brand and the titles all the way along but this is a game for those connoisseurs out there that that uh, would go to a car museum that would like to know more about the ideas uh, behind some of the engineering and the manufacturing of some of these vehicles and the history around some of these vehicles you get all of that in this game you also, uh, and there's more than 400 cars that you can pick up as you work your way into it. It's a true car PG, and it's uh, been another overwhelming experience on the uh, the tail end of Horizon Forbidden West and Elden Ring, and then I'm into this thing, and I just feel like, holy crap, I'm in front of the, the television just grinding away, trying to unlock everything. And of course, um, you're going to be going to world famous tracks like Daytona, you're going to uh, some, you know, different ideas like the uh, Tokyo Expressway um, and you're going to be tr you know racing on in all kinds of vehicles you'll have super powered vehicles you'll have like supercar type vehicles you'll have full-on racing vehicles you'll have rally cars um, this is a game that obviously also likes to celebrate its beauty with these incredible uh, replay uh, moments where they air, everything is kind of tuned to the music that's uh, supplied within this game, which is also incredibly diverse and elaborate as much as this is a game filled with destinations for you to travel to and lots of cars to pick up. It's also got a ton of music, and so there's classical music, and there's kind of jazzy type music in this, lots of rock and roll and stuff. I'm really impressed. I, I don't love all of the music, let's be honest, but I, I am impressed by the diversity of it, and it's fun to kind of just, you know, explore the world of Gran Turismo and hear all of these tracks, and it's not like leaning onto so much of a, you know, licensed catalog. I'm sure there's some licensed stuff in there, but it does feel like a lot of content was made expressly for this game, and and it's a wonderful collision of all of these different styles, you know, and it's kind of a, a great analogy for the types of vehicles that you get to drive. But you cruise around the world and each of these de different destinations has different tracks that you can go to and there's different layouts for the tracks. So you'll be racing around, you know, rings and ovals and, uh, you know, much more challenging uh, types of tracks with lots of chicanes. Uh, you'll be traveling and racing through traffic. Um, and uh, you're going to be in a, in a fleet of different vehicles. There are also missions in the game, so you can go in and uh, you'd, you'd be challenged. You'd be sort of mid-race, and you'll try to get to uh, as far up the the standings as you possibly can before everybody crosses the finish line, and, and you'll get bonus points and, and bonus credits for being first to cross the finish line. Um, and, of course, there are lots of other different ways for you to celebrate everything as well. You basically are spending a ton of time in this cafe where you go to. It's incredibly peaceful, and what happens is you get these uh, objectives within the game where, you like in this case, I had to find these rally cars which were unlocked by um, just completing some of the objectives. And then once I've picked up three on the menu, then we celebrate that, and they have these beautiful... Um, uh, sort of vignettes where they show the vehicles in these gorgeous scenes and they you also get the ability to not only you know see the Gran Turismo folks put all of this content together and and celebrate your victory and and talk to you about the history and show these cars from different angles and stuff you can also go into a, a, an element called scapes and you can actually tool around and um, position your vehicles. This is the, the Aston Martin DB5 right there. And the, the other two cars that are in the background are two from my library that I actually dropped into the background. 
and you can focus on any one of the vehicles. You can change the lighting. There's all kinds of different ways, and you can save that as well. Um, and there's a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different backgrounds, which are kind of photographic and look either you know beautifully rendered at the highest resolution based on um, scan data or something, or they're actual photographs. But you're taking your in-game car assets and you're sticking them in, and you're seeing what all of these different lighting parameters and all of these different details. It sounds ridiculous that there is this much detail on this side piece of content for the game because obviously this is a, uh, you know, it's a racing experience where you're trying to unlock, uh, you know, all kinds of new vehicles. That's basically it, right? You get looped into racing to win the credits, to buy the vehicles at the, at the different stores that you get or you unlock them and, and you add them to your menu. Uh, for the cafe, and then you go back and you get another objective that you have to go and complete, and and uh, you keep unlocking them, and you rise up the standings. There are also lessons like there have been in lots of previous Gran Turismo games where you get challenged with learning how to make the, the corner at the correct time, um, and uh, you have to do these lessons over and over again until you complete them and then you'll get your beginner's license and then you get a level A license and you'll just keep going up the standings and all the while be handed faster and faster vehicles which make turning much more difficult. And you can see there were many, many failures along my way, but here's the thing about this game and why I think this is my favorite of all the Gran Turismo games. I mean, there is an element of surprise that can't be duplicated when I think Think back to the PlayStation 1 era, and that was the heyday, man. That was when uh, Kazunori-san and, and the uh, Polyphony team came out with the Gran Turismo idea and rocked the world, became one of the most successful brands and franchises in PlayStation history. And that's why he gets so much time and his team gets so much time to craft these things. And you can tell, like they travel around the world and they take photographs of everything and they get into these vehicles and they do brand deals with these vehicles. There are special exclusive vehicles that are launched through Gran Turismo. It is an incredibly important property. But one of the things that has always been true with uh, Gran Turismo is that uh, it, it's it's been a game of, uh, you know, navigating through menus and waiting for these massive tracks with all of their details to kind of load up. And I'll tell you what, on the PlayStation 5, that loading is, well, obviously a much, much faster and it's less of a um, an ordeal to contend with at all. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the setup with this game, of course, is that they they have this cafe and you have to keep going, kind of going into it. And so you're constantly jumping into these menus and back out of these menus. And um, you're looking at all of the, the different data that's on screen in a regular, you know, you know, regularly. And it's very, it's almost set up like a website. So there's this feeling like, yes, eventually this will go to PC for sure, but it loads really quickly. So that removes, you know, comparatively to previous Gran Turismo games. It's not quite like the open world, like race everywhere you want to in for, uh, Forza Horizon 5 and then you find everything. You're still jumping from destination to destination. You can see some of the load times right here, but it's much quicker even if it is a little bit cumbersome because there are multiple button presses that you have to press in order to get to where you want to go. And I found it a little bit frustrating that I couldn't change some of my car parameters before I um, left a screen. I had to go back to specific screens in order to change my tires or my engines and uh, or you know my turbocharger or whatever and then go back in, into the event that I wanted to race. And that got a little bit frustrating. But suffice to say, it's way faster to load and you know there's just tremendous amounts of data coming into the hardware for you to be able to access these beautifully 3D generated environments and, and um, uh, you know, these racing experiences. So you've got that element and then you've got the DualSense, 5, the DualSense uh, for the PlayStation 5 and the DualSense controller, this is the best experience I've had with the DualSense controller. You feel every bump and scrape along the road. You feel when you're shifting gears, you feel your your engine throttling up, you feel the tarmac, uh, you know, uh, if you're racing on a street, you can feel kind of the, the grooves on the road and the, the little, uh, uh, the markers along the street. Um, and you can feel like the tires 
racing against the asphalt and it just feels incredible you you are super connected to the experience and it's so thrilling to race like that like you just get into it and it's it it's so addictive you know you just feel like you are fully on the road in a, a much more palpable way than i've ever experienced in the gran turismo game before and the one thing that i definitely can say about the gran turismo games is that they're a lot more austere and uh, a dry, uh, a little bit antiseptic in a way, you could say, especially when you compare them to the, uh, uh, the crazy energy of the Forza Horizon series or Need for Speed or, or some of the stuff that Codemasters has been working on. Um, uh, definitely Burnout, you know, like there's lots of other good racing games out there. And Gran Turismo has always been this, uh, you know, kind of study of racing history. And that can come off a little bit dry, you know. Um, and that's the case here. But I think it is these interesting elements all working together and you not fighting with the hardware technology and being able to jump back and forth from all of these things. There's even this really cool kind of uh, music rally that you can choose to play, which is a little bit like OutRun with music where you're trying to hear these different tracks and race for as long as you can and every checkpoint that you get to, more time gets added to the clock. Love that. I haven't played the multiplayer because I was playing pre-release code and the servers go live in a couple of days, but I imagine it's, it's gonna be incredible. Um, there's also a sport mode in there and there's like the way that the content and the information is doled out to you as you play um, is incredibly addictive and incredibly inviting. Uh, it's, it's the full package, you know? It's also different from, uh, especially Forza Horizon, and we haven't got a motorsport game from Xbox on the current machine, so we haven't got that to compare it to right now. But it's definitely a lot different from the Forza Horizon experience and, and most of the other racers that we've got on this uh, PS5, Xbox Series X kind of generation. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did. I always find them to be a little bit dry, especially since the shock and awe of the original Gran Turismo games has long since worn off, you know? And we've gotten lots of good ones along the way, but we've also had lots of really incredible competition out there. But this is an excellent PlayStation 5 game. Now, I haven't played it on the PlayStation 4, um, but I had so much fun playing this game, and I think it's just, uh, you know, it's obviously gorgeous. I mean, I'm not even talking about the visuals, but the uh, you can depend on these visuals and the details and the environments and the, uh, the day-night cycle, um, the beautiful reflections. Of course, you've got a ray trace mode that you can race at or the, uh, the, the version of the game that will focus more on frame rates. But to be honest, I didn't really feel much of a difference. Unlike a lot of other games where you're kind of prioritizing ray tracing, um, when I jump back and forth between the 60 frames per second and I would imagine the 30 frames per second on ray tracing, I, I thought it, they both looked incredible. They looked great, but I, I, uh, I did notice a little bit more detail when the, the uh, software was prioritizing the ray tracing, especially when I was racing around in the, uh, in the city streets. It was uh, absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. And the, there's 3D positional audio in this thing as well. And I mentioned the music. Um, but more than anything, it's the feel of the game and, and the addictive constant generation of challenge. You know, like try this, try that. See if you can get to this. Can you beat this time? Um, can you augment your vehicles and then try that again? You know, and, and uh, go back and, and uh, beat some of these tracks and some of these opponents that have been kicking your butt. It's a wonderful, wonderful game. And, you know, clearly made with so much attention to detail and so much passion. And, uh, you know, talk about a studio that's been at it for a long time that has never stepped off the gas, never let their foot off, foot off the gas. They've always wanted to crush it. But I think longtime fans of this franchise are really gonna love it. I also think that it's a uh, an excellent pickup for people that are kind of new to that idea, this kind of car sim, car PG. It's, I think it is the easiest barrier to entry of the Gran Turismo games. I think a lot of attention was paid to making it feel incredibly accessible. And of course you can race, you know, the arcade mode of each track as well and throw in any vehicles that you want. There are time trials that you can set up for yourself. You can customize the way you want to play the game. Um, and you can customize the, the way that you uh, fetishize the vehicles in this game. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, there's just so much bloody content 
that <laughs> you're going to be playing it once you put down Elden Ring and Horizon Forbidden West. You're going to be playing this for months and months and months. And then, of course, there'll be DLC and all kinds of other material. But I loved it. Uh, I don't love it. You know, if you're asking me if I like it more than the Hor- uh, uh, Forza Horizon 5, which was a Game of the Year contender, no, I don't. Because I, uh, you know, I loved the... the uh, uh, arcadiness and the silliness and the, the zaniness of uh, Forza and the beauty of that game. Uh, but, you know, they're built differently. This is much more of a, um, it's almost like a, like a classic traditional style video game, you know, where you're beating a level and then you're moving on to the next level. And Horizon is an open world game where you're just going in and exploring and and, uh, trying out as many crazy things as the designers have put together for you. Um, There's, you know, similarities in some ways in terms of visual fidelity and the way some of the cars handle and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, you can't play Forza Horizon 5 on the PlayStation 5 or vice versa. Uh, so yeah, I definitely think that this is a pickup for anybody that digs racing games out there. It's uh, the best Gran Turismo I've played in many a year. I'm gonna give Gran Turismo 7 a nine out of 10. All right, I've got one last thing to tell you guys about, and that is a, uh, a new trailer for a Brad Pitt movie called Bullet Train, which is based on, I believe, a Korean action film. I have not seen it, uh, but the trailer hit today. It's coming out from Sony this summer, and it's uh, directed by the uh, the guy that brought us uh, De- uh, Deadpool 2. So there's a tremendous amount of action in this movie, and we don't normally see Brad Pitt kind of step into these you know, larger than life, over the top action type roles. There's, you know, always a physicality and an element of action in the performances that he puts together. But this does look like Brad Pitt is sort of taking a page from the Deadpool slash John Wick playbook and uh, he looks badass in this movie and so he's facing off a bunch of uh, against a bunch of assassins on a train um, which gives the, the movie a little bit of a diehard kind of vibe to it um, and uh, there's some interesting other you know other actors that are popping up in here some really cool character actors but we're seeing Pitt throw all kinds of punches and trying to be cool um, where he's uh, but he's getting stabbed and he's getting uh, you, you know threatened in some pretty massive ways um, and it just looks like it's going to be crazy fun, man. Um, some some really interesting, uh, you know, visual stimulation in this trailer. There's samurai swords, massive explosions, lots of sun flares. We got to beat up Brad Pitt. I'm in. Comes out this summer, and uh, Bullet Train looks incredible. Now I want to see the original, though. I really do. You guys excited about Bullet Train? Let me know in the comments below. All right, you guys, that's going to do it for the rundown today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again tomorrow with a brand new episode for you. In the meantime, make sure that you check out everything that we've got going on on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash EPN. And thank you so much for subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EPN TV. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you to our followers on Twitch and our subscribers on YouTube. And of course, to our EPN members. You guys are incredible. We'll see you soon. And until then, play forever.